and is this really necessary? And so um, just, you know, some patience is very important when we're, when we're working on, on these farms. Um, assess the best methods to use, and it, it is going to be different on different farms. Um, live and dead, dead stock, feed, water, eggs, all that stuff has to be dealt with. Um, guidance has been developed that's flexible, but also addresses all different types of situations because, as I said, we're going to have a lot of different situations to work in. Um, are we more prepared than before the outbreak? Definitely. I think a lot of people are, and hopefully some of these educational um, workshops and meetings and the practice that we're all getting is helping us be more prepared. And that's all I have. So I will turn this over to Josh Payne um, to do the next portion. Okay, thanks, Gene. Um, I've been asked to talk about some of the turkey composting procedures that uh, we implemented in Iowa, as well as some of the lessons learned from that experience. Uh, I spent about 21 days there assisting with disposal efforts this uh, spring. So here's a typical Iowa turkey operation, and you can see we brought in carbon material to store outside of the, uh, the barn. <clears throat> and the process uh, of composting, I like to think it actually starts post-euthanasia. You're dealing with a fairly dry litter product, probably around 20, 25% moisture. And ideally, you'd like to get that moisture content up around 50%. So the foaming process can assist with uh, adding more moisture to that litter for composting purposes. Bear in mind that we're only foaming part of this house, so the challenge then would be how do you get additional moisture to the rest of that dry litter in the house. As far as prepping the house, uh, these carcasses will not be evenly distributed. So that's one step, is to first get the carcasses distributed throughout the house if you're going to be composting. And you certainly want to secure any loose cables and hoses so that the equipment uh, will not get entangled with that and uh, damage the house. Here we are forming pre-compost windrows. And this is an easy step that uh, I think any producer or contractor can implement just to get the process started. We're essentially, remove, or we're essentially moving litter and removing it away from the, the sidewalls and uh, pushing the litter and the carcasses uh, into what we're seeing as the formation of windrows. This is about 10 feet from each sidewall. And then uh, you'll go down the center of the house and, and remove litter and carcasses, forming two windrows. Think of this as a, a jelly roll of carcasses and poultry litter and, and manure uh, all mixed together. Uh, just this simple process, uh, you can actually heat up those windrows and start deactivating virus. So I like to see this step implemented rather than leaving the birds abandoned. Um, easy steps right here to heat up a pile and start killing virus. Many times I would see these type of windrows heat up to 115 degrees. Uh, Gene talked about <clears throat> emptying feed bins and capping it. Uh, they worked well for us. I like to see the feed evenly distributed over the windrows. You'll need some laborers to go along the sidewalls and remove any organic material that's uh, along the sidewall. And uh, keep in mind we're removing the litter down to the floor. So depending on the age of the house and the litter, there may be some, uh, some litter that's been in there for years. And uh, you're going to need the right equipment to uh, actually get that down to that uh, hard pan or that clay floor. Adding water, we mentioned this earlier. Uh, I recommend if you have tank sprayers to go in the house and actually wet the litter to get it to that proper moisture content. 
Um, when we did not have access to that, our last resort was turning waters upside down and letting them uh, drip on top of the, uh, the windrows. And we're looking at around 50% moisture content. Um, you know, I tell producers that I want this consistency similar to chewing tobacco. You're actually, you can see a picture of this where you're squeezing the product and uh, it should leave some dampness on the palm of your hand, but you shouldn't be wringing out water uh, with this. We would then come in and cap the windrows with carbon material. Keep in mind, uh, we were dealing with large turkey carcasses, so this was a great step for adding more carbon so that we, uh, we have a good carbon-nitrogen ratio balance and we get a, a better compost. So uh, I do recommend capping those windrows, especially when you're dealing with turkeys. I think if you're dealing with broilers, you might could get away without capping that uh, windrow and, and you could just push all the material together into uh, to one final windrow, which I'll show you how we get to that step now. Uh, on any windrow, certainly recommend having a base. Uh, this is absorbing all that carcass leachate that will be coming from the thousands of carcasses that you'll be placing on this. An 8 to 12 inch carbon base is recommended. This is about 12 to 15 feet wide in the center of the house. And you don't want to drive your equipment on it because driving the equipment on it will actually compact that base. Bear in mind, we want airflow to go through this base. So the airflow is coming out of the bottom or coming through the bottom and then coming up the top of the windrow, similar to a chimney effect. And uh, that's why it's important not to have that compacted by equipment. Now that we have our two uh, pre-compost windrows on each side we will, and a base formed, we will then take both of those windrows and uh, place them on top of the base, forming one final windrow. And here's an example of a house. We have the sidewalls cleaned very well. We have the floor cleaned as well. And we form those two windrows into one final windrow and then capped it with additional carbon material. It's important not to drive a skid steer on the side of these windrows. And uh, you might use long-handled rakes to help um, maneuver some of those carcasses and make sure they get covered. Um, I, don't, I don't like to see workers uh, walking on the piles either. This, uh, believe it or not, can uh, cause some compaction. And this is an aerobic process, so we don't want to compact it down. Uh, the final windrow. Uh, Gene mentioned these are long houses. The turkey houses were you know, 640 feet long, um, 55 feet wide, and we formed one windrow. We had plenty of space in there to move equipment around. Uh, some of our other houses, we will encounter challenges uh, due to lack of space and, and due to equipment that might be in our, in our way. These were 5 to 7 feet high, about 12 to 15 feet wide. After 14 days, at least, we would turn these piles. Here's an example of the turning process. And uh, you can see that we have, within just 14 days, formed a black humus-like product. Uh, you're not seeing any carcasses or feathers. So if you build this right, um, and that's a that's very important aspect, if you build it right the first time, you can uh, compost this down very quickly and, and reach temperatures uh, well above 131 Fahrenheit. In fact, most of the piles that I managed were averaging around 140 Fahrenheit. <clears throat> this is the same picture of uh, end of phase one composting after 14 days, that black humus-like product. You can actually see some of the steam coming off of that as we're turning the piles. Uh, we targeted these piles at a 45 degree angle with a skid steer, and uh, we would just push the material forward and uh, lift it up and, and dump it into uh, a new windrow. So essentially you're taking that windrow and moving it down the length of the house. And that process worked really well. Before I would uh, approve a windrow to be turned, I always like to open it up and get a good profile uh, look at it. So this is a compost windrow profile. And again, you're not really seeing carcasses here. Uh, we've reached our appropriate temperatures and we have effectively composted these carcasses down. More pictures of opening a, a pile up. Uh, this is what you want to see. You want to see the material inside heating up and if anything you might see uh, some
some soft tissue. The lower right picture shows some smoked turkey after 14 days. And the end of phase two composting, 28 days later, uh, this makes a great fertilizer. And you may hear some myths about it not being a good fertilizer. I'm not sure why, where these myths came from, but in Iowa, uh, a lot of people were saying you're adding too much carbon to it. It's not going to be a great fertilizer source. And I kept telling people, I said, yeah, but you're also adding a lot of nitrogen to it. If you have 10,000 50-pound turkeys that you're adding to a windrow, that's a heck of a lot of nitrogen. You're also adding feed ingredients to it as well. So the end product should be valuable fertilizer and have plenty of nitrogen. Another thing you have to consider, yeah, you're adding carbon, but if you compost it properly like we're showing you here, that carbon is going to be broken down and a lot of it converted into CO2. And to prove this, I have a couple of farms that I worked with, and these are average analyses from uh, different barns they had. So we're looking at, for each farm, we're looking at two to three average analyses. And uh, 60, 46, 36 was from one farm. That's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in pounds per ton. And that's actually pretty darn close to what you would see in just your turkey litter. So this is more than just a valuable soil amendment. It's a great fertilizer source. All right, some of the lessons learned from uh, the experience. Uh, plan ahead. Every poultry farming operation in the U.S. should have a disposal plan right now. Uh, they need a step-by-step -step process as to what they will do should avian influenza infect their farm tomorrow. The producer obviously needs to be a part of this plan because they can greatly assist in uh, this process. Some of the best farms I worked on, we had uh, producers that were willing to assist and they got in there and, and really helped out a lot. <clears throat> Another thing I like to emphasize is coordinating between the depopulation and disposal crews. So the goal is to depopulate these infected birds as fast as possible so they don't continue to spread the virus. But at the same time, there needs to be good coordination from the disposal crew so they are set up, they're, they're there with their equipment, and they are ready to enter that farm as soon as the depopulation crew leaves. Uh, we really struggled with that in Iowa because we just simply didn't have the manpower or the equipment from the disposal end. And uh, so what happened is we had a lot of birds that were depopulated and uh, left in the house for days. And, and that's not a good idea. So have that crew and equipment ready. If you're composting, you need to already have a list of carbon sources, and uh, you need to have some carbon en route. Supplies, labor, and uh, equipment, don't wait until the 11th hour to try to purchase this stuff online. You need to have PPE now. Uh, think about portable pressure washers, because any equipment entering or leaving a farm is going to have to be deconned. Hand pump sprayers work great for throwing in the back of the truck. And, you know, don't expect when you go to a farm they're going to have a decon station set up for you. You're going to need to be doing this yourself. So having that PPE, having the disinfectant with you, uh, make sure you have the right equipment. You're going to need operators, uh, thermometers, 36-inch thermometers. Uh, I would go ahead and be purchasing those now as opposed to waiting and trying to get it if it hits uh, your, your state. <clears throat> Lesson one, um, if you have a, a foamer that is leaking water, don't continue to, to go ahead and foam the house. Uh, stop operations, fix the, the leak. Uh, we had an issue here where a leaky foamer flooded a house, and uh, this is a, a complete mess. Um, you can see tracks on the right side where I'm walking down the center of the house, and you would just fall through that litter and into, uh, into water. So uh, this creates a, a huge, huge challenge for any disposal effort if you encounter a farm like this. Lesson two, avoid leaving carcasses uncovered for days. Carcasses left uncovered for days attract flies. Uh, flies uh, lead to maggots, and uh, then you've got a, an even worse fly problem. I think of flies as mice with wings uh, in regards to vectors of disease. And, uh, so this is not something that, that you want to see. 
and at the very least, you know, sometimes a producer could go ahead and take that and form those pre-compost windrows and at least uh, get some of those carcasses composting down. Lesson three, if you didn't take my advice on lesson two, you're going to have a fly control uh, issue and a fly control plan will need to be implemented such as spraying something like a permethrin uh, around the piles. Lesson four, have the properly sized equipment. If you choose to uh, have small skid steers, um, they may not work very well depending on the operation. Uh, so the skid steers that we were first uh, brought, uh, first delivered to the farms were too small. and We couldn't really get in and move that, that litter, especially if it was hard pack litter. So uh, payloaders worked great if you have access to those and can get them in the barn. They can move large amounts of litter and they can also move large amounts of uh, carbon material. I, I prefer the, the uh, track skid steers and I, re I recommend a mid-size skid steer for, for moving uh, litter efficiently and effectively. <clears throat> Producers can be your friend. Uh, if they have the equipment, they're efficient operators. They're used to working in a poultry facility, and uh, they can work very efficiently at forming these uh, windrows and uh, can do it in a matter of hours. So if they're willing to do it, I highly recommend working with a producer. Pole barns create maneuvering challenges uh, was another lesson learned. There's no cookie-cutter approach to any of these farms. And in fact, there's no cookie cutter approach to any barn. I would I would enter a farm, and every barn I would go into, I might have a different plan as to how we would tackle that for composting. If you're going to have to use bio bags, make sure you have somewhere to dispose of them. If uh, the private landfills decide that they don't want to take them, then uh, you may be stuck with them. And that's one issue that we encountered in Iowa. Um, buyer beware whenever you're sourcing carbon. You're going to need a lot of carbon. Uh, word is going to get out that uh, there's a lot of carbon being bought and some of the carbon suppliers uh, may just see this as a big fat government uh, checkbook and they'll send anything that they can put in a truck to you. And uh, there's got to be quality control on this. You have to have someone on site and if they're going to send you junk you have to turn it turn it away and send it back with them. For the most part, we had good carbon, but uh, we had one or two bad batches and then uh, rumors get out that we're sending bad carbon in the houses and it, it doesn't go over well. Another lesson was store the carbon near each house. I learned this from Bud Malone. If you're, if you're bringing in semi-loads to a farm, you don't want it all unloaded on one side of the operation have it equally distributed in front of the houses because your equipment is going to be moving inside and outside of each house and you want to work as efficiently as possible. Pile security is a challenge. You need to limit traffic as much as you can. Uh, the counties in Iowa had actually set up some roadblocks to help limit traffic. There's going to be a lot of nosy neighbors. Uh, there's going to be media flying over in helicopters, driving around in vans and uh, even activists, and uh, all of these can uh, create biosecurity challenges, especially during a highly pathogenic outbreak. And Gene mentioned this before, uh, producers can be, can be a biosecurity challenge. If we're fully suited in personal protective equipment and the producer rolls up in a truck and gets out with uh, no plastic boot covers, walks into the house, walks back out, it kind of leaves you standing there scratching your head. And the human impact, uh, Gene did mention that as well, but be mindful that you may be the first person that uh, these producers are seeing, and they have just uh, suffered not only the economic loss, but the, there's a social and physiological or psychological impact as well. Um, so you need to be understanding, compassionate, uh, but at the same time have a plan and convince them that you have a plan that will work. Your needs and considerations, <clears throat> carbon inventory. I think every state should be looking at what carbon supplies they have. I think we need to also be looking at uh, 
alternative sources of carbon that maybe haven't been used in the past. You know, when I went to Iowa, I had not worked with corn stover, so we weren't real sure how well it would work, but it ended up being awesome. It, it worked really well. We got the temperatures we wanted. Uh, I hear questions about other carbon sources like hay, uh, peanut holes, et cetera. So whatever you have in your state, you need to be assessing that and uh, looking at that inventory. Biosecurity training, I think uh, it needs to be amped up in, in industry. Um, we need more of that to prevent it uh, from entering other farms. And uh, so I think that's a, that's a challenge right now, getting more information out there on proper biosecurity. And then composting training. You know, uh, Lori Miller from, from USDA APHIS had mentioned before that we have about two dozen experts on, on this mortality composting uh, in the U.S. And at any one time, we might only have five of those people maximum deployed. So uh, I know they're working on this in Maine. Uh, in November, they have a Maine composting school that's going to focus on this subject and uh, getting more and more people trained on how to, to uh, do mortality composting in large catastrophic events is uh, something that I, I see as important. And then lastly, we as the uh, USDA mortality composting technical team has uh, published mortality composting protocol for avian influenza infected flocks. And uh, this was recently put out there on the USDA APHIS website. The easiest way that I could tell you to get there without sending you a long link uh, is to search USDA mortality composting protocol, and that should pop up. Um, there might be someone that can place that in the chat box uh, here in a second while we're fielding questions, though. So, but that's out there. It's a great resource. I would uh, recommend taking a look at that.